Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, this is uh, lecture four. Uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, history, history two. All right. So for today, what I want to do is uh, I want to review a little bit. And then I want to talk about these three subjects, the Spanish fury and tra taxation, secularization and the scientific revolution, and Galileo Galilee. OK, so um, let's get started. And for review, I want to present this uh, this document by uh, Martin Luther, Freedom of a Christian. We've talked about this before. Uh, the book authors have mentioned it before. And so let's look at this primary source. And this is relevant to the context paragraph. Remember that I want bullet points. Uh, who to whom? What type of source did the author write? When did the author write or experience uh, the event or the action that he performed? Uh, where did the author write or experience about this event he experienced or this action he performed? Uh, why did the author write? Uh, what to is uh, what is the historical significance of the author? And I call it what to because we've already have a, the first what is about what type of source uh, the author wrote. Okay. And what we can do is if you look on the right, this is uh, Martin Luther, Freedom of a Christian. However, we do have a secondary source, an introduction by a historian to this primary source. So be careful. If you quote from here, you're quoting from the historian, from Catherine J. Lualdi. Okay? You're not quoting from Martin Luther. So be aware of that. All right? And you can use this secondary source to fill out some of these bullet points. Okay? So pay attention to that. Um, let's go to the next slide. For example, who to whom? Who to whom? Uh, Dr. Lualdi tells us German monk Martin Luther's attempt to reform the Catholic Church, and then, oh, and here I made a mistake, but that's why you have to be careful when you read. Okay, so it talks about uh, he was excommunicated by, excommunicated by Pope Leo V, the 10th, in 1520, and then he published several treatises. Okay, attacking church uh, authority. Um, and notice that I made a mistake. I put Martin Luther to Pope Leo the, the 10th, but that's incorrect. Okay, I'm going to cross it out because it is in your, uh, it is, uh, it is there in the, whatchamacallit. It is there in the, my PDF notes. I will change that. So Martin Luther to fellow Christians. All right. He set forth the guiding principles of his belief with particular clarity and freedom of a Christian, although originally uh, written in Latin and addressed to the Pope. The tract was soon translated into German and widely circulated among Luther's ever growing number of followers. So it's addressed to the Pope, but is the Pope really his audience? OK. And that's a judgment you have to think about. Based on the reading, do you think it was actually addressed to the Pope as I originally had? Or is it addressed to fellow Christians? Okay. And the languages are important here. Educated people at that time, and actually many clerics. Clerics means priests. Uh, it can be nuns. Uh, it can be monks. So that's a term for all, for members of the church hierarchy. Since it's written in Latin, that suggests that Martin Luther wrote for clerics, okay? Later, it's going to be translated into German because, remember, Martin Luther was uh, was German. His native language was German. Germany doesn't exist, but people do speak German in different provinces at this time when, uh, when he wrote in 1520, okay? So the country does not exist, but there are different provinces and kingdoms that uh, where the majority of the people speak German, all right? So uh, pay attention to that. What, what kind of uh, document was it? And it talks about it being a treatise and so on, okay? When, where, okay? So fill those out. Um, and for a lot of this, you can use uh, Catherine J. Lewaldi's introduction, which can be considered a secondary source. It's a secondary source because she relies on primary source, her knowledge of primary sources to 
introduce Martin Luther. She's an expert on Martin Luther, okay? We go to the next one. Now we get to the text. This is that what, what uh, Martin Luther actually wrote, okay? And for that, usually you can get the answer to the why or the what to, the historical significance, all right? You might get some clues from the introduction, but again, when you read and when we read this, notice how many people have considered Christian faith an easy thing, and not a few have given it a place among the virtues. Remember what the book authors discussed, what I emphasize? Uh, Protestant denominations place an emphasis on what to get to heaven, okay? And see how he's beginning to talk about faith here, all right? Um, so make sure you do that. Uh, again, pay attention to that. And here I have it again. So the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. And in this case, Lutheranism, we have the founder of Lutheranism, Martin Luther, uh, writing again to an audience. He's, he's seeking, he's being more forceful now. Uh, the 95 Thesis were in the forms of questions. He was trying to reform the Catholic hierarchy from within. In this treaty, now he's more upfront about it. So that suggests his audience is, is uh, no longer the bureaucracy that doesn't want to change, but he wants to, he wants to, he's writing to Catholic clerics that might want to change. And later it will be translated into other languages for other educated people who write in German. Okay, Latin was the language of, uh, of reading and writing up until about the 1300. And then you get challenges from the, the different uh, lo uh, local languages like German, like Spanish, like uh, uh, Castilian Spanish, like uh, English, okay? But until the 1300, most works in Western Europe were written in Latin, okay? So let's keep going. And then we get to the Spanish fury, taxation, and, and the aftermath. So uh, this section uh, is came from this question. Why was the Spanish Fury a symptom that government in the 1500s and 1600s needed more money to enforce the religious aims of their leaders? Okay. Remember what uh, your book uh, authors mentioned, the textbook authors mentioned about the Spanish Fury. Spanish soldiers are going to sack uh, Antwerp, which is now in Belgium. Back then, 1576, Belgium did not exist as a country. Okay. The Netherlands did not exist as a country. They're next to each other. And that region is going to rebel against the Spanish Empire. The Netherlands will gain independence. Belgium will, will uh, decide, the leaders of Belgium, what's now Belgium, will decide to continue to be a part of the Spanish Empire. Okay? So this is the Spanish Fury, this massacre. And the reason is that these troops were unpaid for months. They were being housed in this city. And... Uh, they went on a rampage, uh, looting and killing people. Looting. Uh, that's a term that's used uh, usually when armies steal from people. Okay? So looting, stealing things from people, killing people. Uh, the reason, I'm not justifying them, but that was the reason they were unpa unpaid for months. Now, armies are paid with taxes. So let's talk a little bit about the tax taxes in the U.S. before we talk about taxes in the Spanish Empire, okay? And and I'm teaching you this because uh, this chapter, chapter 15, uh, emphasizes how uh, governments gain more power. Um, and one of the ways they gain more power is they find different ways to tax, and they have larger armies that they can then use to enforce these different taxation methods, okay? So in the U.S., in the high government, meaning the federal government, remember how I showed you high, middle, low government? So the high government, in the U.S., it's a federal government. You have your income taxes, company taxes, investment taxes, and tariffs. Those are the main ways that the government gets, gets money from its citizens to pay off certain things. And over here, I found this breakdown of US government spending, okay? The federal government, again, the high government. 13% education, 10% defense, 12% welfare, other, 
pensions and social security and health care. Okay, so that's how the federal government spends what it takes in. All right. And this comes from Barnhorst Office of Management and Budget. Um, now, let's go back to the 1500s and the 1600s in Europe. Um, notice how in the U.S. it's 10, defense is 10% of the, of the 2020 budget. Okay. Um, but for governments in Europe in the 1500s and the 1600s, military spending was number one. That's what they spent the, the most money on, military spending. Okay. Bureaucracies back then for other for other things like uh, healthcare were basically non-existent, very if at all. You might have like the king, like the Catholic king. He's a Christian. He might support some charities, uh, but the percentage was was definitely not what it is today. Okay, so mostly uh, mostly military spending, and they have to spend on manpower. The soldiers themselves, you have to pay them. They're also spending on supplies. Uh, and weapons, and I cannot stress enough the importance of supplies to an army. You have to feed it, you have to clothe it, clothe the, clothe the soldiers, um, and a very famous commander said, an army marches on its stomach, okay? So an army marches on its stomach, so again, supply is very important. Uh, it keeps morale up, and it can also, again, you have a large number of people with weapons then you don't pay them, they could turn their weapons on your population, okay? But there are reasons why the Spanish king could not pay his soldiers. Now, let's look at taxes in the Spanish empire, say from about 1516 to 1648, okay? So for these Habsburg rulers, remember Habs Habsburg is the family, and these Habsburg rulers like Charles V, Carlos V, Philip II, and others, um, they're gonna get a lot of money from the Americas, a large amount of uh, money in the form of silver, okay? So silver, um, the kings take the royal fifth. It's, uh, that comes out, that should be 20%, but in my research I found that 20% did come from the kingdom of Peru, which is labeled as New Castile here. I've never heard it called that, and this map, for some reason, they call it New Castile. But this is the Peru, Peru region. There are very wealthy silver mines in what is now Bolivia, which is about right here. And the king takes a 20% cut, okay, in the form of taxes. 20% of what's taken out belongs to the king. All right? Now, in northern, uh, in New Spain, which is now northern Mexico, this northern part, you have, again, a lot of silver mines. Um, and there, 10%. Of the silver, uh, the mine silver goes to the king. Um, this is one of the reasons why the peso will become the first world currency. All this silver, pesos are minted in silver, and silver that those taxes will be sent to Spain on a with a convoy to protect it against uh, against pirates. All right, so uh, the silver will be moved to what's now Panama, and then to Havana, Cuba. From there, from Bolivia, Peru to, uh, to Panama, then Havana, Cuba, and then from northern New Spain, down to Veracruz, and then to Havana, Cuba, where the convoy, convoy will sail and transport those silver shipments to the king, okay? That's the major source of revenue of the Spanish Empire, okay? These, uh, again, these taxes in silver. They also get taxes from se selling offices. Uh, if you want an office in middle government, uh, you pay off, you pay a certain amount of money because you see it as an investment. They practice what's called tax farming, meaning that uh, let's say if I want an office, I pay a certain amount of money. Let's say it's not a small amount. For us today, it would be something like I don't know, $20,000 for a middle office. And in return, I collect the taxes and I keep a, po keep a portion of those taxes. So that's sale of offices, another source of revenue, tariffs at ports, taxes at ports. You tax ships bringing in uh, material. Uh, and then you can also, and remember the final one, 
is tithes. Remember that agreement between the Pope and the Spanish king? That the king is going to send tithes to, to the Pope, all right? But he can also, also take a little bit of, uh, of those tithes for himself because he is defending uh, the Catholic Church in, in Europe, okay? So uh, think about that agreement between uh, the Pope. And the Pope does rule this region here. This is the Pope's land, okay? So he is also a political leader. He needs the support of people like the Spanish king. And then the spending, again, most of the spending is on the military. And then you have other, other things. Now, military spending. You have these, these, uh, this new technology, which is expensive, all right? So if we focus on land first, then we'll focus at sea. But on land, you have these new gunpowder weapons. Um, they cost a lot more money than the old weapons, than your bows and arrows, okay? Uh, and the reason that people adopt uh, these gunpowder weapons, the early ones are actually, they're worse than bow, bows and arrows, except that it's easier to train people with gunpowder weapons. That's the major reason that people adopt these, uh, uh, these early muskets. They're clunky. They're very clunky. They're hard to use. Um, well, not hard to use. They're, uh, they're not very accurate. Actually, they're very easy to use because if we compare how long it trains someone to use a bow and arrow versus uh, how long it takes to, uh, for someone to use a, an early musket, we're talking a big difference, okay? To be, a, to be a good archer, I mean, a really good archer that can function in battle takes about a decade. English longbowmen, they, they, learn, um, they learn how to shoot the bow and arrow from a very early age. However, with the arquebus, this, this early musket, it takes weeks to months to learn, to train people, okay? It is definitely, the, the arquebus is less accurate than the bow and arrow, okay? Um, it, it has a slower rate of fire. You can't fire as quickly. Uh, in a good army, you can fire one round, one bullet a minute. And if we compare that to an English long, longbowman, an average English longbowman, they can shoot 12 arrows a minute with accuracy, okay? And uh, gunpowder weapons are more deadly when they connect, but again, they're not as accurate. That's why armies are fighting in a line, okay? Now, again, these gunpowder weapons are more expensive, all right? And, and there's a video there. I'll not show it, but you can cut and paste it and take a look at it. And it shows you the Spanish tercio. It's a formation that starts off, tercio means third. It starts off with uh, people holding pikes, these long lances, people with swords, and people with muskets, and how they fought together, okay? In that way, they learned to fight together, which is a new innovation um, when the Tercio first began, was first developed. And it's gonna, it's gonna be the main unit of the Spaniards uh, in the European wars, all right? Now at sea, uh, you do have these cannons that are more deadly, and they're more expensive than catapults which used to be used on ships, okay? And other weapons that were used on ships. Uh, but if you have them on your ships, you have a very large advantage over ships that do not have the, these weapons. And we'll see more of that next week, the enormous advantage that gunpowder weapons give to uh, naval, uh, give to ships, okay? So to these, uh, these European ships that have a large amount of weapons. Now the other expense is you got you have to pay your soldiers uh, and your sailors, and as you saw, when you when the pay is late or if you underpay them, you're not paying them enough for what uh, uh, then there's a likelihood that they're gonna do they're gonna commit atrocities. Okay, there are uh, you have the Spanish Fury and other massacres in Europe, and in the Americas. You have Spanish soldiers stationed on the borders next to independent indigenous peoples. And it's definitely documented that uh, these soldiers would supplement their pay by slave raiding among indigenous peoples, right? 
Now, another issue having to do with payment of soldiers and sailors is that once the Protestant Reformation begins, sailors from certain regions become Protestant. And they've already sailed. They've already know the locations of many uh, American ports, but they're going to defect because their land is fighting especially the Netherlands. They're fighting to become the area of the Netherlands and Belgium. They're fighting to become independent from the Spanish uh, Empire. Again, this is a map of the Spanish Empire. You see how this is part of uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Okay? Right here. And they're going to defect and in some cases take those ships or take knowledge of these ports which is going to be important for next week. Okay, they're going to take that knowledge. Uh, many of the pilots on the ships, the people who who knew where to navigate, were Dutch or from the Netherlands. Okay, which again becomes uh, Protestant and is going to fight uh, a decade decades long war to become independent from the Spanish Empire. All right. So uh, now. These uh, Habsburg kings, they need more money. They always need more money because they become the representatives of the Catholic Church in Europe. And as we you learn by reading the chapter, uh, different areas, especially the German-speaking areas and the northern and central areas of Europe, you have many people becoming Protestants and many political leaders becoming Protestant and fighting against, uh, fighting to protect, in some cases, fighting to protect their right to worship uh, their Protest as, as their Protestant denomination dictates. In other cases, they want to impose. So it's both. It's, it's not just to protect, it's also to impose. Pay attention to that, okay? Uh, also with Catholics, they're fighting to protect in Central Europe, to protect their way of worship, but also to impose. It depends. It's it's a uh, these are messy wars. All right. So to to raise money, Philip II. In 1580, he, Philip II becomes also becomes the king of Portugal. Remember, your book mentions how in 1578 the king of Portugal uh, died in a battle in North Africa, and he didn't have a successor. So Philip the king also from 1580 to 1640, uh, Spanish kings will also be kings of Portugal. So they're going to gain access to Portuguese possessions and Portuguese uh, trading families, okay, which have connections throughout the world and are very wealthy. Um, and Philip is going to borrow from some of these Portuguese merchants, uh, some of his own merchants. He's going to borrow money, but they're going to charge him interests or they're going to want monopolies to different, uh, to the, to some of the products from the Americas. Okay. Um, and either interest or they could, um, they also want as time advances and the wars become more and more expensive. These silver shipments are just not enough. The sources of revenue are just not enough. So what Spanish kings, what Habsburg kings start to do is, uh, Habsburg kings of Spain, they start to uh, borrow money based on the next year's worth of silver from this royal fifth, from the taxes on the silver from the Americas. Okay, And this is great for the merchants because, again, they're going to make a profit. Okay, uh, They lend the king a certain amount of money. But then, because they need to make a profit, they'll charge back. They'll uh, they'll get that next silver shipment with interest, or a portion of that silver shipment with interest. Okay, and as that continues to happen, uh, Habsburg kings will go bankrupt a few times uh, in the 1500s and 1600s. Okay, their revenue is not enough because they're fighting. Uh, they're not. They're fighting Protestants. Uh, these uh, different wars, again, they're fighting Protestants, uh, provinces in the Holy Roman Empire, Netherlands, England, Sweden, okay? They're also fighting Muslims, especially the Ottoman Empire, which is very powerful at this point in time, okay? So they're fighting the Ottoman Empire, and not only that, but they're also fighting the French. Uh, 
they have a border with Spain. Their uh, political leaders are Catholic, but they're also uh, afraid, cautious of growing Spanish power. So the French are going to make an alliance with the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so look at how many fronts, how many different powers the Spaniards are fighting, and that's why the revenues are not enough. Okay, uh, for these growing armies, for this new technology. Okay, uh, so remember how your book mentions that you have governments gaining more and more power? Think about taxation. Think about how will they use these armies after the wars are over. All right, so pay attention to how governments gain power. Now, uh, a brief example from another country. Uh, so the Netherlands, uh, to raise money and their fight to, to gain independence from Spain, they're going to create the Dutch West India Company. It's a joint stock company, meaning that different investors uh, put in money for the company to uh, make money. And uh, in this way, if they were to lose out or to have like, uh, if this company went bankrupt, then the individual uh, joint stock owners would not go bankrupt because they only invested a portion of their fortune, not their whole fortune, okay? And you have people, uh, the government of uh, the Netherlands, the growing government uh, that wants to gain independence, creating this, uh, create this Dutch West India Company. And the main purpose of this Dutch West India Company, West India, is a name for the Americas. So this company is going to get involved in trade in the Atlantic from the Americas, Africa, and Europe, okay? So they're gonna to start to get involved in the slave trade. They're gonna to start to compete against the Portuguese, all right? Remember, Portugal becomes a part of Spain, becomes a part, part of the Spanish empire, part of this empire ruled by the Habsburgs. So the Dutch, uh, Dutch ships are armed with cannons. Uh, they're gonna to start to uh, smuggle, become smugglers, and become pirates okay we'll talk more about this next week so this dutch west india company invest money with different ship captains so they can trade in the atlantic okay between the americas africa and europe all right now as far as wars you can see uh your book goes into uh, a lot of detail on the wars so i'm not going to spend time on them and you can also look at this. I like the Kings and General series. And this one is pretty good, I think. The first six minutes gives you a good introduction uh, about the reasons for the wars. All right. And and this one is the Spanish Tercios, which I already had you guys. Uh, I talked about it. So again, this is in the PDF notes. You can uh, cut and paste it from there. Now, let's get to the different peace treaties because they, they are important. So the first one is 1555, the Peace of Augsburg. And these electors, remember the electors, you have uh, leaders of these different kingdoms that are kind of united into the Holy Roman Empire. And the electors su su select the leader of the Holy Roman Empire. So there's a lot of politicking. In theory, the leader of the Holy Roman Empire is the high government. The electors are the middle government, but this high government is 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 weaker than the governments of like say let's say the high government of England, the high government of Spain. Okay, it is weaker. There's more negotiation between the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire and the electors who rule these uh the, these middle level kingdoms that make up the Holy Roman Empire. All right, and what happens is that. These electors decide that uh, with this peace treaty, they agree to let the leader of each of these kingdoms uh, uh, choose uh, whether they're going to be their population is going to be Catholic or Lutheran. OK, so the, the elector, the ruler of these subordinate kingdoms will decide, oh, yeah, my province, uh, my kingdom will be uh, Lutheran. And then another, another one will say mine will be Catholic. They do exclude, however, uh, Calvinists. Calvinists are not part of this deal. All right. Page 499 in your book. Then 1648, Peace of Westphalia. This one is even more important because for the first time, 
You're going to have diplomats from all the warring countries, all the countries at war. They're going to uh, they're going to meet and they're all going to decide and guarantee the agreements that they come up with. All right. And these are the agreements. Uh, and this is an example. This is the beginning of the system we we tend to use today, this international system. So this is the first step toward that system uh, in this decision to uh, to have a peace conference with the leaders of all the countries that were at war, all the kingdoms that were at war, all right? Um, and now this is gonna settle the religious disputes in Central Europe, because now the leaders will be able to decide, uh, again, what religion they're gonna support, uh, and Calvinists will be included in this agreement. And what ends up happening is generally, um, Lutheranism, it becomes dominant in the north part of Central Europe. Calvinism becomes dominant in the Rhine River area. And then Catholicism becomes dominant in the south. Okay, so generally, that's how it breaks out. That's how, the, how it develops due to this treaty, how the leaders, the political leaders decide. And if we look at winners and losers, Definitely Netherlands, France, and Sweden are the winners. The Netherlands, they, they do gain recognition. You'll still have wars between the Netherlands and Spain, but now it's it's more uh, a sense that the Netherlands is an independent kingdom, an independent republic, actually. Um, all right. Um, let me see if I go republic. Oh, I won't say republic. I'm not, I have to double check the government of Netherlands, but it becomes an independent country, okay? Um, the losers are definitely the Habsburgs in Spain and the Habsburgs in the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, this ruling family had different leaders ruling both Spain, the Spanish Empire, and the Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. Okay? So Spain loses the Netherlands. They do keep Belgium, though. though. Uh, the people in the Belgium area decide to stay with Spain. All right? And the Holy Roman Empire, uh, again, the rulers, the Habsburg rulers of the Holy Roman Empire are Catholic. They would have preferred that the electors be Catholic as well. But of course, that doesn't happen. The electors can choose to be uh, Catholic, Lutheran, or Calvinist. All right. Now, the, this next section. Now, secularization. Secularization and the scientific revolution. Please take a look at uh, what we know about the solar system. Here you have the sun, you have the planets, uh, there's earth, okay? So secularization, um, partly influenced by the wars, many political leaders uh, after the Peace of Westphalia, this treaty, uh, they won't go to war for religious reasons. They'll go to war for political reasons, but just not religious reasons. Uh, these wars were exhausting. All right. And what's going to happen around this time period, not just because of the wars, but because people, the printing press and people are becoming more educated because books are uh, become cheaper. Um, and not only that, but you have like university libraries can buy more books for their students. So students are getting better, ed a better education. Uh, and one of the results of this better education is a scientific revolution, okay? This is an overturn of ancient beliefs about the universe, okay? Um, it's definitely controversial, as you'll see, and it's going to lead to new understandings of the, of the universe. The two most important are heliocentrism and the scientific method. Helio means sun. So we're going to understand that the sun is the center of our solar system. Back then, they thought the universe was a solar system, basically. They didn't, they didn't have our telescopes. So uh, if I use the universe, that's what I mean, okay? So the sun is the center now. And before 1532, this is a, a drawing of their beliefs. Uh, the earth was the center for them. They thought that the earth, and this thinking that, that the universe is centered on the earth, comes from um, the Greek thinkers, okay? Um, but
but also these Greek thinkers uh, that propose this, they also reinforce biblical beliefs that the Earth was the center uh, of the solar system. All right. Again, in their view back then, they don't have our telescopes. The universe is basically the solar system. Okay. And not even that far. I think they knew um, Galileo Galilee is going to discover the moons of Jupiter, I believe. So they probably knew up until Jupiter and probably Saturn, but not much beyond that. All right. So remember how I told you about those um, Hindu Arabic numbers? So these Hindu Arabic numbers will allow uh, new types of math, like algebra, which are going to be put to good use by mathematicians like Nicholas Copernicus. Okay. So if he was trying to use uh, Roman numbers, he would have had to use the abacus to count because it was impossible to count with Roman numbers. All right. Think of Roman numbers. One, two, uh, this is 50. This is 100. Think about adding C plus L. It gives you CL and then you add two. How does that go? Uh, no, this uh, the Hindu Arabic numbers are much easier to use in calculations, uh, especially because zero, you can use zero to make bigger numbers, okay? Like 350, you just put a five and then a zero, you can just stack them up and add them. You cannot do that with Roman numbers. I challenge you to, to do that with Roman numbers, okay? So you have Nicholas Copernicus. He mathematically proves that the sun is the center of the universe, okay? And you have Giordano Bruno. He's going to teach. Uh, the Copernicus will publish his work, and Giordano Bruno will teach heliocentrism, a sun-centered universe, but again, the belief at that time was that the earth was the center. And so Giordano Bruno is going to be accused and is going to be tried uh, in the Inquisition court. And he's going to be found guilty of heresy. And he's going to be burned at the stake. That's the punishment. Uh, it is the Inquisition. It is a court. People do go through a trial. But of course, many people do get sentenced to death because they practice their practices contradict Catholic teachings at that time, like Giordano Bruno trying to teach uh, what Nicholas uh, Copernicus, a Polish mathematician, had found and had published in his book. All right. You also have someone like Johannes Kepler. He theorized the three laws of planetary motion, and he theorizes that, that instead of a uh, Okay, so three laws of planetary motion. One of those laws is that uh, the planets do not go around the sun. Sorry, let's go to this one. The planets do not go around the sun in a perfect circle, but in ellipses, which is like a long, a circle stretched out, an ellipse. Okay. Now, as time passes, you have another scholar who is going to use telescopes. This, uh, this uh, scholar, uh, Galileo Galilei, he learns that other people are using telescopes. They're using mirrors. They're positioning mirrors in, in these devices so that with a mirror, you can see far away distances. Telescopes, the ones we use today. But, um, and he's going to use these telescopes to prove, uh, to prove that Copernicus was right his math was right, all right? And he does publish his results. And because he publishes his results, he is going to have, he is going to uh, be uh, accused before the Inquisition. He is going to have an Inquisition trial, all right? And because he's so famous, he's given a chance to take back what he wrote or to be sentenced by the Inquisition, and he does recant, meaning he takes back uh, he takes back his uh, what he had written, and he says, uh, "I was wrong. It was an Earth. It is an Earth-centered universe." But of course, you know he was right. But he was forced by the Inquisition to do that or face punishment, most likely death. Okay, and for the rest of his life after the 1633 Inquisition trial. He's going to be under house arrest. 
all right? And your book also mentions Sir Isaac Newton, laws of motion and gravity. And again, why do planets go around? Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Why do planets go around the sun? Gravity. Uh, every action is in one opposite reaction. And um, all of us have, a, have gravity, so we attract, uh, you know, everything that has mass has gravity. All right, let me go to the next one. Scientific method. Here's an example of the scientific method. Um, before the scientific method, um, you have these scholars, and I'm using scholars because the term scientist was in use back then. Today, we would consider them scientists, but these scholars would try to find the truth in texts, the truth for the laws of the universe in, in what previous writers had written. So they would use textual analysis. And uh, these new scholars, uh, they're opposing this view. They're like, no, we shouldn't do that. We should use observation. We should observe like our environment. Then uh, we should do research on a certain area. For example, I don't know, bees. Do research on bees, see what their actions are. Um, and again come up with a hypothesis try to test that hypothesis with experiment with an experiment analyze the data after the experiments are done report the conclusions and then that will lead to new observations and new questions and knowledge gives us a greater understanding of the natural world all right and that's inductive reasoning testing hypothesis with experiments okay like Okay, using the scientific method. Then Rene Descartes, Sir Francis Bacon was English Protestant. Rene Descartes is a French Catholic. And he's the one that said the term, I think, therefore I am. And for him, that's the one truth. Everything else should be examined and should be doubted uh, until it's proven with math, with mathematics or mechanical methods. Okay, with math or mechanical methods. And this provides the basis for investigating the natural world, the natural world, okay? And the last section is Galileo Galilee. And again, I have the questions from your context paragraph. Again, this is the introduction by the scholar uh, that I mentioned previously. And this is the text, okay? So this is the text, oops. I forgot to delete this part. Yeah, yeah, so this second part is found in the next one. But again, you have the PDF of this already, all right? So there you go. And notice, notice what he says. Uh, Galileo Galilee, he's writing to the Grand Duchess Christina. Again, very educated individuals. And he's justifying this is before his Inquisition trial. <coughs> I discovered in the heavens many things that, I, that had not been seen before our own age. Again, notice how diplomatically he's bringing about his discoveries. The novelty of these things as well as some consequences which follow from them in contradiction to the physical notions, to what people believe at that point in time, commonly held among academic philosophers, again, their word for scientists, stirred up against me no small number of prof professors as, as if I had placed these things in the sky with my own hands in order to upset nature and overturn the sciences. Again, his discoveries are changing what people knew back then. Okay, the truth set forth, so pay attention to how he does it, how he presents his discovery to Grand Duchess Christina in 1615. And again, was it Grand Duchess Christina that gave him up to the Inquisition? Uh, it probably wasn't just one person, okay? So uh, I'm not a specialist on Galileo Galilee, so I cannot answer that question, but it's definitely something to, something to think about, which people accused him. Because to be tried before the Inquisition, you have to be accused of performing certain acts that are seen as heretical. 
Okay, I talked about uh, people who were uh, uh, crypto Jews who were practicing Judaism in private, but then somebody turned against them, discovered them, accused them. Okay, or people who were members of the LBGTQ uh, community who were who were seen like again um, showing showing their love in certain ways that were not accepted by the Catholic Church. They'll also be place before the Inquisition. And again, also remember priests who abuse their power can also be sent to the Inquisition court. All right. So again, history. Yeah. All right. So today we talked about the Spanish fury and taxation, secularization and the scientific revolution and Galileo Galilee. So think about how I talked about it. Uh, I talked about it. Think about how this can help you understand the book better. Thank you.